Good morning and welcome. I'm Joe Ruffalo, General Manager of The Hill. I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming here this morning, uh, both in person and everyone online, for our Future Defense Summit, Accelerating Innovation and Next-Gen Defense. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Lockheed Martin, for their support of this very important discussion today. As geopolitical tensions continue to rise, the need for strategic investments is in emerging technologies to defend the United States, its allies, and its partners against growing threats has never been greater. At the same time, the nation faces a unique and critical opportunity to strengthen the U.S. defense industrial base to deter America's greatest adversaries. How should the U.S. best ensure industry capacity, resilience, and collaboration on emerging technologies with its allies and partners? And as the front lines move increasingly from boots on the ground to cyber warfare, how prepared are we to defend ourselves in the changing face of conflict? We hope to answer these questions and to discuss how to build an advanced defense industry and enhance deterrence through a robust and integrated defense network. Before we get under underway, for those of you in the room, we ask you to please silence your phone, but we encourage you to join the conversation online. You can follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram at, at the Hill Events using the hashtag TheHillDefense. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce our first guest, Senator Deb Fisher, a Republican from Nebraska and senior member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And she joins our very own Bob Cusack, Editor-in-Chief of The Hill. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joe, and thanks for everyone who is uh, watching and has come here on a, a very early Thursday. Uh, Senator, I want to ask you news of the day, but it's also very relevant to this discussion. Uh, as far we saw the House last week, uh, last night, try to pass a continuing resolution. Are we going to be, it did, and it failed, as expected, uh, where do we go from here as far as avoiding a shutdown? Well, obviously, in the Senate, we're watching what goes on in the House yes. <laughs> uh, to be able to see um, what they're able to put together and send over to us. I believe uh, Leader Schumer will um, file a shell bill right. to be able to uh, adjust to whatever comes over or to fill it with what he uh, decides needs to be done. And we'll take it up probably next week. Uh, there's been controversy, obviously, about the legislation, what should be in it, but also on the time frame. Uh, do you support a shorter time frame, three months, or more like six months? I support a shorter okay. time frame. I would like us to be able to uh, address the needs we have in this current year, get it done before the end of the year. So no matter um, who wins the presidency, we can start moving ahead and start planning for what we need uh, as soon as possible in January. Um, you know, this last Congress, we didn't get our committee assignments until uh, into February. I hope that doesn't happen again. Uh -huh. Whoever's leader, I hope we can uh, be able to get our committee assignments and really get to work. You know, it's important. I'm on the, not just Armed Services, but Appropriations Committee. And to be able to uh, take up uh, those bills and do it quickly so we can be on schedule, get back to regular order, um, that's just vital for mm -hmm. the process to be able to do it. I give Chairman Murray and Susan Collins a lot of credit for the last two years. And I've just been on appropriations two years. Uh, but it, to be able to uh, have our hearings, to be able to do oversight, to be able to show uh, the American people that we're doing the work we're supposed to do in oversight, to have that accountability, uh, it, it's vital mm -hmm. that we do it. And uh, yeah, I, I give them a lot of credit. When I first saw the schedule, I thought, ooh, this is ambitious. And, uh, but it worked. It worked because we all wanted it to. So are you optimistic that there'll be, there's no shortage of drama on Capitol Hill, as you know, but do you think we'll avoid a government shutdown by the end of the month? I would hope so. Okay. Uh, speaking of bills, you've introduced the Restoring American Deterrence Act. Can you tell us a little bit about that measure and uh, its, its path to passage? It is a great bill, first of all, <laughs> a great bill. Uh, and it's, it's a good bill because it, it follows the recommendations that came out of the Strategic Posture Commission. Mm -hmm. This was a, a bipartisan commission uh, that came up with 81 unanimous uh, recommendations. That's almost unheard of in this day and age. And they are um, recommendations that, that truly address the threats that we now face. 
and I incorporated many of those into the legislation that I introduced. I thank Chairman Reed because uh, he also put uh, um, my bill, basically, the, from those recommendations into the chairman's mark in our NDAA that we've passed out of committee. We want to be able to uh, keep those in there. We want to make sure that they're part of the uh, conference uh, that comes out of the House and Senate because they're, um, they make sense. They make sense to address uh, two peer nuclear competitors. They make sense to be able to address the workforce needs we have uh, with regards uh, to our nuclear enterprise. They make sense in, in setting plans that we need in order for uh, looking, looking especially at our ICBMs and mm -hmm. what we need there for our land-based uh, ICBMs. Makes sense on looking at a third uh, shipyard for nuclear uh, shipbuilding. So it, um, yeah, I think it addresses um, not just the threats, but the pace we see, uh, the breathtaking pace that we see our adversaries have in meeting their nuclear needs. Uh, speaking of adversaries, what, what keeps you up at night? What are the challenges? I mean, it, it, I know most elections, and, and this one included, are focused on domestic uh, issues. But if you really think about the foreign policy challenges ahead for the next five to 10 years, they're quite daunting. Um, which adversaries are you most concerned about? Well, you'd have to say China and Russia. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, it is the threat that they pose. We're, look, we're looking at, at two peer adversaries when it comes to, to our nuclear uh, deterrence that we have. We're behind. You know, we are barely on schedule when it comes to, to our nuclear triad and being able to continue to modernize the platforms that we have. And, and we look at just ad addressing our strategic needs when we have adversaries who are looking at uh, the, what they want to address in theater or a novel nuclear um, progression as they move there. We, we are um, very mindful of that. In fact, every time we're in a classified briefing and, and uh, we get reports from a, from a number of our combatant commanders and, and uh, the secretary, uh, my comment is always, you know, well, when will we get there? And my second comment is always, that's too late. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, you mentioned the Strategic uh, Commission report. There have been some critics of that report who said it's a doomsday scenario, it doesn't factor in costs. Um, wh wh what is your response to that criticism? It's a realistic scenario. Okay. Why? It's a realistic scenario. You, you had a commission with experts when it comes to defense of our country, when it comes to national security. They came together, and these are people that uh, don't necessarily agree on everything when it comes to our national security. They did on this because they, um, they received, obviously, a number of briefings. They understand what the threats are, and we need to move past um, uh, the Cold War, uh -huh. where we kind of just dropped the ball on everything. We need to move past the Gulf War and the Iraq War, where we uh, did not uh, pick up the ball again and be able to produce, for example, the munitions that we need uh, and really uh, take a serious, rational, reasonable look at what the the needs are that we have for our national security. Uh, you mentioned muni munitions. I wanted to ask you about that. I'm not a defense expert, so for people watching, why is it so important to increase uh, the nation's uh, munitions capacity? You know, we learned that. I think it was uh, one of the first lessons we learned uh, from, our, um, from our activity that we have with Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. When we have our allies um, sending munitions to Ukraine, as, as we are as well, and for us to be able just to backfill what our, what our allies are sending, let alone meet the needs of this country, um, we, don't, we don't have that capability right now. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to have a production, and we need to be able to produce them fast. Uh, we don't have that. So 
probably at least two years ago, um, I started asking at, at hearings that we had in SASC about munitions. And if we have what we need so we can continue to provide for our security uh -huh. before we're sending everything overseas, before we're helping our allies, we have to make sure uh, that we can meet our, our needs first, that we can protect our homeland first. And um, I, think, I think that's been a wake up call as well. So when I talk about we need, we need to be able to have that production capacity, uh, that is very serious and, and we need to do it. For the Gulf War and the Iraq War, it took I think up to two years before they were able to meet the capacity for huh. just those wars. You mentioned you're on appropriations and, and obviously the Armed Services uh, Committee. Uh, my colleague Alex Bolton did a great story today about how the Harris and Trump campaigns are, uh, their proposals are quite pricey and they're not really, they have no plan to reduce the debt. And national security officials have said that the debt is a major concern. So in that dual role where you see the import of defense, but also, um, so I want to ask you about the, the Pentagon budget and what we need to do there, but how do we pay for it all? We have to set priorities. We have to set priorities as a country. And obviously the first duty of Congress is to provide for the common defense. It's to, it's to be able to provide for our military men and women. We have a voluntary military. We need to make sure that, that we care for them and compensate them well. And we need to be able to make those tough decisions and look at programs. Um, and, and ask the question, is this truly a core responsibility of a federal government? And those are hard conversations to have when you're talking about cutting programs, but that's the only way that we are going to be able to meet the needs we have to protect this homeland, our homeland, and still be able to be a leader in the world, because I happen to believe the world is safer when America leads. You mentioned, uh having you know, basically boots on the ground and we, we have an aging population and recruiting is a major concern right now. How do we fix that? We fix it by uh, looking at what the needs are for a, for a voluntary military. And I believe um, on, on the Armed Services Committee in the Senate, we continue to get better at doing that. I know the House has had uh, uh, different committees, in fact, uh, Representative Bacon from Nebraska mm -hmm. led a, yeah. led a uh, committee on that to look at the needs of our military men and women. And, um, and we need to obviously prioritize those, take them into consideration, but also reach a, reach a balance on, on how we can meet the resource needs in hardware for our military, give them the resources they need while also meeting their, their family needs, their physical needs. Uh, you're the ranking member of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Can you tell us the purview uh, of the panel and uh, what's your agenda going forward? We have a great subcommittee and I can't say enough good things about uh, Angus King. He and I have a wonderful working relationship on that subcommittee. When he came on four years ago as the chair, which by the way, I hope to be the chair uh, yes. in January. But God, when he God decent came, chance, based uh, upon the Senate we're map. Hoping. Yeah, yes. But I, I wanna continue our really, really good relationship and our working relationship. And it's because we both put in the time we both um, uh, try to educate ourselves um, more and more uh, to be able to have a, a better and a deeper understanding, again, of the threats that we face and what's needed. Uh, we travel together to Minot, to uh, Stratcom in Omaha. We've, we've uh, gone through lots of, uh, lots of briefings together, just the two of us, so that we can um, not just enhance our education, but so we can keep up to date and, and know what's going on in the world. You, you've name-checked a, a number of senators, and, and all, all in a good way, um, on both sides of the aisle. Um, these issues, uh, we're living in such polarizing times, and uh, obviously there's more bipartisanship in the Senate, but it, it can get nasty in the Senate as well. To fix these massive problems that we're facing and, and our adversaries uh, and the threats are increasing, clearly. What has to happen in Congress as far as people 
getting along and getting things done. I think on the on the Senate Armed Services Committee, we we have a good relationship. Yep. You know, you can see the votes on NDAA when it comes out of committee. Uh, it's passed overwhelmingly. Uh, on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, mm -hmm. um, Angus and I, we've just for many years have have taken the stand that we want to make sure that all our members are educated on the issues, and we have really good attendance at our subcommittee hearings. Our members are interested. They want to know uh, what they need, need to know to make good decisions. And so I've, I, um, I, always, I always say that and give people that information because national defense is bipartisan. Mm -hmm. It should be. It should be. And I think the Armed Services Committee in the United States Senate takes pains to work together to produce a truly bipartisan product that takes, um, that takes care of our military and that protects the country. Question I'm gonna be asking several speakers, what would, we obviously have a big election, looking at the plans for moving forward and protecting the country, um, what do you see as the key differences between Trump and Harris and what would you like to see maybe more of, maybe more specifics on? I want to see any administration prioritize national security. Uh, I've, I don't know if that always happens. Okay. And uh, not to be partisan, but I, I don't believe it's, it's um, it happened with this administration. You've seen the Armed Services Committee in the Senate for the last three years increase what the president sends us for his budget. And that's a recognition by the committee on a bipartisan basis, uh, an understanding, again, of what the needs of our country are, and to try and continue to move forward and budget what we need, not, and we're still not there at what we truly need, but to keep increasing that budget. And so I hope uh, whoever is in the White House that they take it seriously, that they take their job as commander in chief seriously and present us with a budget that is, that is more realistic in recognizing what the threats are in this country. I also hope that the, whoever is in the White House, that they are um, able, this is kind of a mission I've been on for several years, to declassify a lot of material that we hear in classified briefings. Because I happen to believe if the American people have a, a better understanding of the dangerous world we live in, they will be more supportive of what our country needs to do to keep us safe. So you're in those classified briefings and you see a lot of stuff that shouldn't be classified. Certainly a lot of journalists think there's way too much classification going on. I think, I think a lot can be, um, move to unclassified without compromising any personnel or methods. Have you seen any improvements in that area or there's a lot, a lot to be done? I think the Strategic Posture Commission report mm -hmm. lays it out pretty bluntly mm -hmm. and very honestly um, about the situation we're in. So I would, I would uh, commend that report to uh, all journalists and, and uh, folks out there to, to read that and have a better understanding of what, what we do face. Well, this has gone quickly. We're out of time. Please thank the Senator for joining us this thank morning. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I really you appreciate it. Nice meeting you. Do it again.